You're listening to Cash and Sass. I'm Lisa Marie, your go-to gal for all things money. As the Sassy Wealth Queen and the brains behind the Sassy Wealth Coach, I'm here to take you on a thrilling ride from the financial chaos to sassy and sexy money. Welcome back, my sassy friend, to another episode of Cash and Sass Podcast. I am your host, Lisa Marie, the Sassy Wealth Queen and the brains behind the Sassy Wealth Coach and this podcast. And today I have with me Jody Lynn, who is a channel guide and founder of Abundance Consciousness. For over a decade, Jody Lynn Craven has served in a role of a financial advisor, financial edu- educator, and within the last six years, the creator of the Abundance Conscience Philosophy. Okay, that is a mouthful. Unlocking yeah. <laughs> your abundance potential with Jody Lynn with profound expertise in modern currency structures and the financial economy, Jody Lynn goes beyond conventional wisdom. Her depth of expertise extends far beyond traditional financial realms. Her fluency in subconscious patterning, patterning and energy dynamics unravels the often overlooked influences that shape our relationship with money. By delving into the intricate interplay between mindset, energy, and abundance, she assists individuals in identifying and dismantling their abundance blocks, redefining their approach to wealth and prosperity, and her holistic understanding of abundance consciousness positions her as a guiding light, excuse me, for those seeking to transcend limitations and embrace a life of boundless possibilities. Welcome to the show. Um, (coughs) I can already tell I'm going to have loads of fun. Um, because I created Wealth Codes uh, to becoming a wealth queen. And one of the wealth codes that I uh, created was energetic. Um, So um, that got me all excited um, when I first read about um, how you um, use between the mindset, the energy, and abundance, because I believe um, there's more to being wealthy than just money. I believe that it's uh, intricate of things. So that's the reason why I came up with the five wealth codes. Um, And one of them is energetic. So (coughs) let's dive in. My first question to you, and or where I really want to start with our conversation, because this is more conversation than anything, um, is... Tell us a little bit about you as far as where you, where you started with money, money mindset, relationship with money, money, those kind of things, to where you are now um, so that we can kind of get an idea of like the shift that you were able to make. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I'm excited to have this conversation. Um, I feel like I have been all over the place, to be very frank with you. Um You know, my, I first, my story consciously begins at rock bottom. I think where a lot of people find themselves when they start to do work on their mindset or work in energetics or any sort of personal development for me. Um, I was in a completely different industry. I was actually in the safety industry in oil and gas and I was making great money and I was in a very abusive relationship and I didn't know how to get out of it. And I was in this position of, you know, I, I felt I had no confidence whatsoever. I had been just figuratively beaten down, not literally. It was um, verbal abusive or verbally abusive relationship. And um, I remember having this conversation with my dad because I really felt stuck. I thought that there was nowhere for me to go at this point in time because my ex and I, we had a house together and we purchased right before the crash of 2008. And so fast forward a couple of years into our house purchase, I'm having these realizations, I'm going through personal development courses, I'm starting to build my confidence back, and I'm realizing something isn't right, but I feel stuck. Um, Because our house that we paid $350,000 for was was no longer worth worth the money because of the market crashing in 2008. Right, exactly. I built built a house right before, like literally, Really, right, but bo- um, right as the right before the market crashed and closed on it, like yeah, it, I so I, oh. I I know exactly and sold sold my uh, condo, um, which is why it ended up having to be a short sell because it went up for sell before the market crashed and they appraised it, and then the market crashed and now they had to go and reappraise it because of all the stuff and it no longer appraised for what it appraised for before. Yeah, it was oh. so so when you 
when you say that 2008, I'm like, yes, I know all too well <laughs> exactly how that right. affected so many people. Um, yeah. So, it, so you it, felt stuck. And hard. I can imagine, especially with that, because, you know, if you pay $300,000 for a house, now all of a sudden you're finding out it's not being appraised for what it was being appraised for before because mm-hmm. the appraisers were not doing their due diligence and appraising things correctly. And apparently that had been going on for a while, right? Um, to no fault of your own, it, you know, and this is an, right? this is an example of how... Life happens and it's of no consequence to anything you did wrong. And you still have yeah. to make a decision on, okay, am I going to live stuck or how am I going to react to it? Because how we react to it is going to determine how we move through it. And so I really, really glad you yeah. brought that up because 2008 affected a lot of people. And some of us stayed mm-hmm. stuck for a little while. <laughs> Um, and that's okay too. It, well, well that, because at the time we didn't know what to do, right? I mean, you exactly. felt you felt stuck. You you yeah. you weren't sure what the next step was for you to do because there was so much uncertainty at that point. Um, mm-hmm. And and that is okay. And not staying there forever is what the the and then what can you learn from it? I think is what um, is 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 a huge piece of it. So how else did you feel stuck from, you know, you were living in a house with him. Y'all just bought it. Now you finding out it doesn't appraise for what it appraised for. Um, what else? What, where do what, we go from here? Yeah. Where do you go from there? I mean, cause I know yeah. how I, I, I'm sure there are many listeners who, um, well, I mean, if they're around our age, they know what, what 2008, you know, what that market crashing did. Um, yeah. And, and so where, how did you, you felt stuck and you talked to your father, but how did you move forward from that? Yeah. Well, I think just to go back for a second, I think that so many people in the personal development community and outside of it, and just in our society today have this negative um, relationship with responsibility. And I actually talk about this a lot in my courses because we treat it like a fault finding mission, you know, a big stick that we're going to whack ourselves over the head with. And you nailed it, you know, saying that to no fault of my own, to no fault of a lot of people's, you know, shit hit the fan and it wasn't your fault. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And you can still take responsibility. And that's where this conversation came to because I was learning and I was growing and I was at this point where I could see that my relationship was no longer serving me, that it wasn't going to serve me long term. But I was in this mindset of, I can't leave. Mm-hmm. I can't go because our house was worth 150. And so what are we going to do? I I can't afford to take over it over on my own um, because it's not worth what we purchased it for or what the mortgage is on it. Also, we shared a driveway with his parents. So not going to stay there. That oh. would not be a great thing right. for me. And so right. I was wrestling with all of these things. And, and when I came to this crossroads, if you will, that's when I spoke to my dad. And I said, you know, I feel like this isn't the right thing for me anymore, but there's nothing I can do. And I think I remember saying that, like, there's nothing that I can do, dad. I'm just stuck. And he said a couple of things that day that forever changed my life. One of them is if time and money can fix it, it's no big deal. And I thought, okay. And he also said in that strain as well, it's just money. And I thought, what do you mean it's just money? Like this, I was 25 at the time. This was my first house. Like my options in walking away from this relationship were bankruptcy, consumer proposal, like losing it all and going to live with my brother, (laughs) which felt like the worst case scenario in the world. And he said, it's just money. But that put things into perspective for me. And then the third thing that he said that really was the, the linchpin to everything that came next was... Either way, Jody, you get to decide. And whatever you decide, you need to choose to be happy. So if you choose to stay, that is your choice. So you're going to have to choose to be happy with that choice. And if you're going to choose to leave, that is also a choice. 
And you're going to have to choose to be happy with that choice and whatever comes with that. And it was instantaneously in that moment, I said, I'm going to leave. And I was on the phone. I was at work at the time. And my dad was like, what, what? Uh, what, like what, what? He didn't expect me to make a decision so quickly, but that's just how I operate. I make decisions pretty quickly. And I knew in that moment that I couldn't with my entire heart choose to stay and be happy. And be happy. I couldn't do that. I couldn't. So mm -hmm. I needed to leave and I needed to be happy with whatever was going to come next. And um, I made the decision that day. I, you know, at, at that point, our relationship was, um, so volatile that he was like taking me to work and like dropping me off and then picking me up and taking me home. And, um, we had, you know, a, a pretty violent interaction in a car the couple of weeks prior to that. Um, although my dad didn't know about that stuff, he knew that he could be volatile and was worried and was like, obviously don't have this conversation in the car or in the truck on the way right, home. Like wait right. until you get home and you're safe. And, and then he also gave me a time limit. If I don't hear from you, Jody Lynn, by seven o'clock tonight, I'm calling the cops. So then I was kind of forced into my decision of like sticking <laughs> yeah. with it and having the courage, um, which I did, which was, it was great. And there was a lot of scary things right, that were going to happen and unfold after that. And for me, it was, I went into this fact-finding mission. Okay, what's next? What is the worst case scenario that will happen here? Um, worst case scenario, I'm gonna have to protect myself because they're gonna sue me. Um, they being the the mortgage company. And you know, I really didn't know too much about bankruptcy or consumer proposal. I just, I knew that that was an option. So I thought, okay, that's where I'm gonna start. I'm just gonna phone some places. I met some lovely people, all of the stars aligned for me to learn what I needed to learn. And I gave my ex some options on, okay, here's the path forward. You can try and assume the mortgage on your own. You can try and, you know, get your parents to co-sign for you. Um, like I'm willing to pay for half the mortgage for another month so we can figure this out. Because by the way, this was five days to Christmas. So, and our mortgage payment was on the 1st of January. So uh -huh. I said, I will... You know, I'll pay for half the half the mortgage um, for the month of January so that we have time to go through these options. And he said, I'll let you know. And for me, I didn't stop there. I started to keep researching, okay, if I'm going to pull the pin on consumer proposal, um, what do I have to do? What does that look like? Who do I call? One of the things that, um, you know, the bank manager told me, because I, I used my dad because he was at the same bank as me to get an appointment with the manager at the bank. Um, I'm resourceful. You got to be resourceful and find a way to get what you're looking for. There's always a way. So I asked my dad to make an appointment with the bank manager because they knew each other and my dad had a bunch of assets under management and so he could get a an appointment with her and so we walked in and my dad was like here's jody and they closed <laughs> the door and, and she was like what i don't understand and i said what happens when you default on a mortgage because this is where we're going and explain some right. things and she told me she told me some things that she said she's not supposed to tell people like you should move all of your money out of this bank because as soon as you default, they're going to take any money that you have and freeze it. And I was like, oh, good point. OK, I got to start a new bank account, got to move some things over. So it was quite a hectic like week and a half before the end of the year. And um, so I had moved all of my money from those accounts. And, you know, I was so afraid that that bank could come after me at a different bank because I didn't understand the rules. I didn't understand my rights. I didn't understand any of that stuff. I was just kind of terrified. So I would put enough money in my new bank account for all of my bills. And then I would put the rest in my sock drawer. Uh, at my brother's house where I was now living with his wife, his pregnant wife and him. Um, I put all my money in my sock drawer just in cash. I don't recommend that. You know, if there's a fire, then poof, it's gone. No, I was going to um, say, yeah, I don't I recommend that at all. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, but I was scared and I didn't have anybody telling me what to do. So that made me feel safe was just having access to that money. And it was actually on New Year's Eve that I got, that I got the text message from my ex saying, you know, uh, that he would not be paying the other half of the mortgage. And I said, all right, me either. And I pulled the rest of my money and I knew exactly where we were going at that point because I had done all of the research. And you so- You were going into foreclosure. It, 
Yeah, we were going to go into foreclosure, and, and it wasn't and for really the sure re- And for the record, they can't come after your money when you default, stop paying, and then do- and go into foreclosure because. Um, I'm 50 and I've been through two of them and I don't say that like I'm proud uh, because I'm not Mm -hmm. Um, again life um, circumstances beyond my controls some some of them I can made probably different decisions okay but still made decisions based on the circumstances at the time and um, uh, we had two foreclosures we went through two foreclosures and a short sale and a chapter 7 bankruptcy and all of them were before I was 30, no, wait a minute. All of them, but, okay. All of them were before I was 40. Uh, most of them were before I was 30. The first two. So the chapter seven bankruptcy foreclosure was before I was 30. The short sale was um, later because that's in 2008. And that, again, was completely... <laughs> I didn't appraise my condo. I did I did exactly the steps you're supposed to take. You're supposed to say you wanted it to be put up for sale because you're buying a house. I was pre-approved for the house to be built. I followed all the guidelines. <laughs> um, of course, yeah. And then, like you said, shit hit the fan. And yeah. and and when you say hit the fan, I mean it hit the fan. It it um and so I remember um, uh, going through that. And um, and here's the thing. I also, many years ago, uh, when I worked corporate, I worked for a foreclosure law firm. <sighs> Don't recommend it. It is very, very stressful. Very stressful. And if you can imagine yeah. how stressful it is for you in 2008, imagine how stressful it is for also at the same time, me in 2008 and working at the foreclosure law firm in 2008. Because at that time, that's when also the banks were being scrutinized and the big banks started buying out some of the other ones because they were knee deep in all these loans that should have never happened because they had Mm -hmm. been appraised too, too high. And the mortgages should have never happened, which even if your mortgage should have happened, it caused yours to be appraised too high because they had to offset the other ones that they made happen that should have never happened. So when I tell you it was a cluster mess, and that's putting it really mildly, it was. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was Mm -hmm. very stressful. I worked in the accounting department. I was their auditor and I had to audit, which means I worked directly with the banks. And the banks didn't know what they were coming or going. And all of a sudden, we had more referrals for deed and lose, foreclosures. Uh, um, what was the other one they would do? Short sales. Because people were like, shit, okay, I can't get out. If you can, because if you if the bank can sell it, then it's basically it's a short sale, meaning they're selling it for less than what's owed. Either way, they get their, mm-hmm. it goes on your credit, but it doesn't stay as bad as the foreclosure for as long. And they don't have to have the property to yeah. It, it resells. So that's all they care about. They want their money. That is all they care about. And that is still scary because it's like, um, well, for me, it was starting over. And mm-hmm. then you had to say, okay, can I trust myself? Like, can I do this again? Can I, you know, because not only that, it's like, are you trustworthy with money to make those kind of decisions? Right. Um, so when you, once you started trusting yourself with your with your money, how did unlocking the abundance potential and and I really want to know about this abundance conscious philosophy because I'm sure it's not linear, right? All of us go through these peaks yeah. and valleys when it comes to money and money mindset. And again, I I say it every episode it doesn't happen overnight. It is a continuous work in progress. Um, and it will always be a work in progress, just like fitness, just like everything else. But what got you to the point now where, because I'm assuming that in order to help others dismantle their abundant abundance blocks, which is part of that mindset, which is what I work with, with their mindset and their money management, because I believe they go hand in hand. That's why I'm a wealth coach slash CFO, um, because I believe you have to have both. 
And that's the reason why I created those five wealth codes. Because again, to me, being wealthy is not being rich. It's actually, um, it's more than that. It's more than just the money. It's the, um, it, the well, the five wealth codes are physical. I got to start over. Spiritual, physical, mental, energetic, and financial. So those five are what I, what I created. And when I think about it, it they all interlock with each other. Because mm-hmm. then we're able to create, retain, and expand the wealth, which is part of that ab- abundance mindset, right? So how did how did you get to the point of of um, doing the delving into the intricate? Uh, we'll start there. How did you delve into that intricate interplay between the mindset, energy, and the abundance? Hmm. Well, I, I, um, I started with the mindset first. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I started with the first, the knowledge of money. I needed to understand how this happened to me. I needed to understand how the financial system worked. And, and for me, I thought there's no better way than actually entering the financial system. And so I started working, um, as a part-time financial advisor and then worked my way up from there so I could understand the system. And then that kind of got me introduced to more personal development, understanding what what I was thinking and then what I was bringing about. And, and then that got me so far. And, and then I realized that it wasn't just the the things that you're thinking and and the actions the doing side of things that there was something fundamentally missing and um i started on this quest of you know spirituality of energy of understanding and you know looking back i could see that i was already having having a spiritual awakening you know very on it early in my life i did a lot of work with horses and um they're all about energy and in my financial career, you know, I would, I would almost start to channel information about people that I was meeting. And I was able to really understand what their hot spots were, what they were really struggling with without them ever speaking to it. It was just this communication that was happening beyond words, beyond body language. It was just a sense that I was getting and and then I would be able to lead them in directions and ask specific questions that would help them open up and help us get to whatever goal it is that they were working on. So I could see looking back that this energy, that energy had a lot to do with it, but it wasn't until I really started to tap into my own energy and understand how I was feeling that that I started to realize everything was out of control, if you will. You know, on the surface, I had this beautiful life. I left safety. I built a financial brokerage that was wildly successful, you know, 10 plus million dollars under management. I had lots of people working for me, beautiful home, beautiful car, and I was empty on the inside. And, and it was so interesting because it started in relationships and I think everything is a reflection of everything else. And so I kept having relationships fail over and over again. And I really just didn't want to be alone. So I had, I I was engaged and I went through this horrific breakup, which felt like, you know, a train hitting a concrete, you know, building. I was dead stopped. And it was then in that moment that I was like, I need to understand me. I need to understand energy. And that's where, you know, I really started to dive in the spiritual side of things. And when I started to relate it to money, I began channeling um, abundance codes is what I call them. It was just questions that would come up. And so, or philosophies that would be downloaded within, and then I would mull them over and, and then talk about them with people who are in my inner circle and just, and start to explore these things. And what I realized was when I looked at the average that I was feeling, the average that I was feeling on an everyday basis, when you looked at me, you're like, oh, she's happy. She's, I'm very positive. You know, she's got this amazing life. But in the quiet moments that made up the majority of my day, I was stuck in flight, 
flight, fight, or freeze mode. I was stuck Mm -hmm. in scarcity. Who's Mm -hmm. my next client? Where's my next paycheck coming from? Because I lived on commission only um, and trails and renewals. So I was building a business at this point. And the only way I knew it was through that hustle culture. So I was constantly in this go, 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 go um, feeling energy. And I could see the more that I was trying to hold on to that and to control. And the more I was obsessed with um, with all of that, the more I would actually push everything away and the longer things would take. So I just started to get curious about my own energy. What am I putting off? And then I actually began to study horses all over again. And understanding that within us and within horses, uh, all animals actually, but horses are really easy to, to, to use this analogy on because they have giant guts. So within a horse and you know us as well and dogs and cats, we have these energy receptor sites. So we're constantly receiving information from the world around us. And a lot of people will call it your gut reaction. Well, that's what horses are reacting to is the energy that you're giving to them, whether you know it or not. And really when it comes to the abundance side of things, a lot of people, myself included, are so, I was, so unaware of what you're putting out there on a daily or average basis. You know, you're trying to be happy, but it's it ends up being this plastic happy because we're taught you just have to be positive. And we're like, oh, the things in my life are so amazing. And like you're gritting your teeth and, you know, squeezing your fingernails into your palms and you're like, I'm happy. <laughs> but on the inside, you're not. Right. You, and for me, I was dying. I felt like I was dying. I was working seven days a week. I was in this hustle culture of team no days off. I was stuck in not only the beliefs of I need to be working to receive, but also the energy of if I'm not working, then I'm not worthy and then I'm not safe and I'm not going to make any money. And it was the combination of those things that kept fueling that hustle culture for me and that, that drive to go out and do, which was ultimately killing me. Right. And so how, what, tell me what is the abundance consciousness philosophy? Explain, explain to, explain to me and the, my listeners, what, what, what exactly is that? The abundance consciousness philosophy is uh, the philosophy that was downloaded to me or channeled through me. It's nine phases of abundance. And basically, it's this spiral that we go through throughout our lives on ascending through money, through abundance, Um, money being our teacher or abundance being our teacher. So we start off at the very bottom of the spiral. This would be the lowest vibrational station, if you will, of unaware. You have no idea and you have no idea where your money is going. You have no idea how you feel about it. It's just not something you've ever thought of. You know, we can all relate to this, you know, either high school or college or something like that. Just no idea. And then what happens is that there's this shift as we're ascending through consciousness, essentially. So we start to see, oh, I have to pay these bills and I have to pay these bills. And a lot of people in our society will get stuck at the second level, which is safety. But everything seems unsafe. I got another bill. I don't have enough money. I haven't worked hard enough. I don't make enough. It's this reaction to life over and over and over and over again. And we're not... Uh, in this phase, we're not conscious of that flight, fight, freeze response that we're stuck in. And then as you continue to ascend or you evolve your consciousness um, and understanding, you get to a level of tribe where you really get stuck in what everybody else is doing. And it's not necessarily competing with the Joneses, but like what the Joneses have, I must have to be happy. I must do this to get that. We take our cues from the rest of the world on how it must be done rather than from within. And then we also put ourselves in this tiny, neat little box. Like I can only do this this way. Um, But the way the universe works is there's billions of possibilities Mm -hmm. and we need to embrace those or even start to acknowledge that there's more than one way to receive these things, to have these things. And then you continue on. The next phase is a centered self where you're really starting to see and go within 
And then the next phase after that is intentional, where you really start to see how you cut yourself off over and over again. And then we get into uh, giving a creator, where you're really creating the reality that you want, giving wholeness, and then oneness. And so we'll fluctuate between these phases. The majority of our society will stay within that tribe, safety, centered self area of things. But as the basic of it is as we consciously evolve our perspective, we're becoming one with all things and that understanding. And the reality is that you already are abundance. Mm -hmm. That is your birthright. That is you. That is your natural state of being. So it's really deconditioning all of the things that you've been told and coming back to yourself to see the real you. Yeah. It, it's it's changing your story, which I talk about constantly and a lot, and and mm-hmm. and um dismantling and um, those stories that you told yourself or that you were told by society, by whoever took care of you, who, whatever, whoever and whatever the surrounding things, because we've <clears throat> it's been deemed that it come, it starts when we're children. We just don't realize it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, and it's dismantling those beliefs and going from when you dismantle those beliefs, I, I go back on what I've said time and time again, what you focus on, you create more of. And Mm -hmm. when we focus on the scarcity and being, like you said, the unaware and the safety and that, you know, the center where we're, oh, if they're doing it like this and I've got to do it like this and those things, that's what we create more of because we're, we're telling the universe that that's, we just, that's what, because we focus on it, our brains say, okay, that's what she wants. And it brings it more. And when we start focusing on um, that abundance, which to me would be more towards that creator wholeness and oneness. And we, again, what we focus on, we create more of. <laughs> so we create more of that. Now, I I am going to say this and I'm going to, and I'm going to make sure I say this really big. It's not easy <laughs> to make those shifts, especially if you've been stuck in that scarcity. However, it can be done. And it starts back to exactly what Jody Lynn said her dad told her, which was kind of was hoping that it was going to tie in and it did. And it's either way you get to decide. So you, ha- you get to decide scarcity or abundance. You, you, you decide. And once you decide, start making the steps to go towards that. Make that your final decision and be happy with it. And, and if it's abundance, make the decision. Most of us don't want to live in the scarcity, right? Most of us don't want to keep yeah. burying our heads in the sand. We just do it because we don't think there's another way. Or we think that the way to get out of it is so hard and so difficult. And it's going to be so restrictive. And I'm here to tell you that just like crash diets, restrictiveness of going from this to that doesn't work. Mm-hmm. They don't work. That's the reason why crash diets right. don't work. That's the reason why they're called That's crash right. diets. They don't work. And so yeah. making the small steps between those phases and moving, and and I kind of compare it to compounding the interest, and I've said this before, it's the small steps compound together that's going to lead you to that. Um, how do you... What is one way you would suggest for someone who maybe sees themselves, let's say, in that safety between that number two and number three um, before they're actually like realizing the center self and becoming intentional? What are some steps, a couple of steps or tips or that you would give the listeners that they would be able to actually um, move from that to going to where they want to go to that abundance part and going, Oh, okay. Tell me how, you know, what, what's, Mm -hmm. what's a tip you would give for them to be able to move in that direction? Oh, I love this question. Um, okay. I, one of the things that I find the, the most instrumental is obviously gaining that clarity and awareness of where you're at. Mm 
without the judgment. Like it's time that we all put our beating sticks away, especially women. We are notorious for this. There is a perfect woman that lives in our heads somewhere that is better looking, says it better, does it better, is skinnier, is hotter, is wealthier, is all of the things that you don't feel like you are. And the reality is she does not exist. Everybody has their own stuff. And it's understanding that our, our reality is our perception. Like we get to perceive what that means for us. And it is very fluid. I talk about this one a lot. Absolute truth. What are the absolute truths? And a lot of time when we're stuck in that fear or scarcity or whatever, like you were just giving the example of it's going to be really hard or it's going to be really restrictive. Is that absolutely true? What are absolute truths? Mm, maybe gravity. Um, that hopefully that the sun is going to come up tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> like, and yet, there's a lot of things and, that we and, consider and, and absolute. The moon, and the moon will rise tomorrow night. And other than and exactly those things, right, yes, like the moon yes. is going to come out. Yeah, ho hopefully. But but a lot of times we look at everything in our lives and we think it's absolute. It absolutely has to be this way. It absolutely is going to happen this way. Well, yeah, if you keep saying that, then you're going to attract exactly that exactly what way. what you're going to do, right? So we need to make room for the possibility. So if somebody finds themselves really stuck in um, scarcity and wants to start practicing something to gain that awareness and to ascend, to have that consciousness of, of awareness so that they can choose, I always give my students um, this uh, four step regime. It's called CAST, C A S T. So the first step is to celebrate. And it's going to sound completely counterintuitive. When you notice you're doing something that isn't in alignment with where you want to go, or you're thinking something in your head, or you're feeling something, whatever it is, you're going to celebrate and you're going to be big and bold and you're going to put your hands up in the air and then you're going to give like a great woohoo at the top of your lungs. Hopefully you're not in the grocery store, but if you are, this will land even harder for you. So the reason why you're doing this is that woohoo, that big explosion of emotion tells your brain, pay attention. There's something here I need to pay attention to. And we want your brain to wake up and start listening to you and you have an active role in what it's doing. Because a lot of the stuff we do, it we're 99% of the time completely unconscious of. It just mm -hmm. does it. Because that's what the brain is designed to do is mm -hmm. to make things easy for you. So we need to wake it up and say, hey, pay attention. So you want to celebrate that you noticed. You noticed that you were going down the rabbit hole of... Uh, my life sucks and I have no money and there's nothing I can do and it's all awful. Yay, I noticed. Celebrate. That's step number one. That's what the C stands for. Okay. And then then you're going to start to coach yourself. So I always use the baby within. So baby Jody, we all got this little baby within us that is having a tantrum. And do you have any kids? I have two. <laughs> You have yeah, two. They're, okay, they're, so you know 20, this. They're 20 and uh, 12, about to turn 13 and 21, and my oldest is um, autistic. So, yes, I absolutely know this. <laughs> okay. So, you know this. Okay, I don't have any kids yet, but... I have been a babysitter a lot. I have a lot of nieces and a few nephews and stuff like that. So when a kid, you know, let's say two, is having a tantrum, can you reason with them? Can you oh, give them logic? Not. To there is no reasoning. There's no reasoning with a 12 year old no. who's throwing a tantrum. No. <laughs> exactly. I let, we, I let her be and I say, when you calm down, we will discuss. And there you and go. That is, that is right. It. <laughs> but we try and logic ourselves when we're mm -hmm. in those moments of having this panicked response of things aren't going to work out. And it it doesn't work either. You can't reason or logic with someone who is having a meltdown. So I always just put my hand over my heart. This is step number two, the A in cast. Put my hand over my heart and I ask, baby Jody, what's wrong? And I allow her to speak. This is the biggest misconception with law of attraction is that you can never, and I'm putting air quotes here. If you're not watching, you're just listening today, air quotes. You can never feel anything but positive. 
that's crap. You're human. You're here to experience. We have contrast for a reason. There is dark. There is light. There is always going to be dark. There is always going to be light. You can't have one without the other. Absolutely. Where dark exists, light also exists. So you put your hand over your heart and you just ask yourself what's wrong. And you allow all of that stuff to come up. And whatever response you need to have, give yourself a moment to have that response. And then we go to the next step, which is, is S in the cast, which is system. We need to calm your system. Okay. So in that second step, it was, you know, my life is crap. This is going to be really hard. I'm never going to be able to figure my way out of it. Okay. Now we're going to calm the system. So do something to get you outside of the fight, flight, freeze. Some easy ways of doing this. If you're at work and you have a desk, just put your forehead onto your desk and breathe until your system comes back to normal, to balance, where you can feel like you're back to that homeostasis again. You can also um, rub on your heart like this. That will help. You can cup the back of your neck. That will help. You can get down into child's pose and that will help. You just want to stay in that moment until you come back to normal. Okay. And then the last thing that you're going to do when you get to that point is ask is it true? Is it true that this is going to be hard? Well, maybe. Is it absolutely true that there's only one way? No, it can't be. There can't be only one way. We live in a universe of billions of possibilities. There's got to be another way. So you begin to ask yourself and challenge the reality that you've been stuck on, the perception that you've been stuck on so that you're allowing yourself to see another possibility or at least be open. And when you begin to do this, you become aware of your responses. Now your brain is hyper aware of that response you just had because you told it, hey, I want you to notice these things. And I always teach it like this. We're kind of like cows in a field. If you've ever, you know, driven by, you know, a big field, you see one cow path. There's like 100 miles to the left, 100 miles to the right. And there's only one, one cow path. Cow. <laughs> <laughs> one cow path. That's how we operate. There's this one way. And by doing this, the more you practice this, the more that you get um, consciously aware of what's happening without judgment. It doesn't matter what's happening. It's happened. That's the past. We're in this moment moving forward. The more you can move off that path and start to create your own path, the one of abundance, the one of the life that you really, truly want. And it sounds like it's a big mouthful to handle all of that. And the first time you do it, it's going to be a lot. But it sounds the, like the time first you do time, it. Yeah. The same, it know? sounds like the first time I'm, I talked about it, movement through music. Um, yeah. I, when I get, I'm analytical. So when I get in, like I'm, which is great at what I do with what I do with helping my clients with their money and the money mindset and money management. I can, like you're talking about, I can, because I'm analytical, I can see things and I can mm -hmm. easily pull it out and, and the same way I can also look at someone's bank account and I can see the numbers and I can tell you what's going on. I can, you know, I can just look at it and I can pull out that and then I can tell you, okay, this is where, this is how we can divide this up so you can get what you want or get where you want. But when I get in my head, <laughs> I become over analytical, <laughs> which is mm -hmm. a good thing. <laughs> so there's that, that, there's that alternate side. Um, and uh, I was telling my coach, it's like, I'm in my head and you tell me to journal, but when I'm in my head, there's nothing going to come out. Right. And so my accountability coach made a comment and she said, how about try some movement with music? And I was like, huh? And it's, it's, it's basically embodiment within yourself and it's embodiment with music. And when you, when you, it's, it's a way to get out of that flight, fright, freeze mode, because, you know, basically they just tell you to move. You don't have to move however you want. I mean, my one coach, he, my coach told me she don't care if I punch a pillow. She don't care if I'm just slashing around or if I'm, however your body needs to move, move, because then you're getting the stuff through and out of your body. So then, and mm -hmm. it's, it's basically another way to bring yourself back to 
the front and center and go, yeah. okay, is it yeah. really hard? You know, is it really going to be difficult? Is it really unattainable? You know, and a lot of times the answer is no, because again, there's only, there's only a few absolute things and there's always more than one way. And I'm going to end this because she said it the best way. Talk about the cow pastures with your business and, and having to pivot and up leveling. Um, I listened to a, uh, mindset thing and it stuck with me and it, because it's true, I'm up leveling. And I was like, Oh, that hurt. Um, because it says every new level of, you know, so basically every time you up level personally or professionally, there's a new devil. Mm -hmm. which means you're going to have shit come up, shit you have to go through, uh, stuff you're going to have to learn, your whatever that may be. And, you know, I, I tell people I've been weeding out the, my garden and I've been planting seeds. And, and I also say that I've been rebirthing. And um, one of my coaches says I've been rebirthing and they know I love Phoenix and they like the Phoenix is about to rise, you know, from the ashes. I was like, yeah, she burning shit down while she's at it too. Like, She's burning shit <laughs> yeah. down and gonna be coming up. I and and when you're going through that, it, it just reminded me when this guy said that, and it was one of those uh one of the things that I listen to on YouTube when I'm doing my treadmill. Um, and he, and you know, m those momentum things. And he says, every new level brings a new devil. And I went, well, mm -hmm. damn, you know, and, and the reason why I'm telling you this is because you're one, you're not alone. And two, no, as an entrepreneur, we go through peaks and valleys. And uh, when we get from that scarcity to that abundance and, and we do these steps that Jody Lynn is talking about, which by the way, I'm literally going to start doing, like I'm going to rewrite my notes. Um, and my VA is going to uh, transcribe it from here and I'm going to take part of it because I think it can be utilized with the music and the movement. And, um, mm -hmm. because when we do that, we are able to see the possibilities of growing and creating and retaining and expanding wealth. And this just shows, once again, you don't have to come from money in order to create and retain and expand wealth. And, and mm -hmm. I just think it's high time that we as women especially realize that if ever was our time, it's now. And yeah. we can actually change the world with us creating and retaining and expanding wealth because women are going to do more good when we expand our wealth than anybody else because we're natural givers. We're going mm -hmm. to do better in the world because we're natural mm -hmm. givers, especially with that expanding wealth. Um, so I absolutely love this. Thank you so much, Jody Lamb, for being on my um, podcast. I probably could talk to you about for at least another 45 minutes. So I'm probably <laughs> going to ask you to come back on because I absolutely love the concept that you have and how you utilize it. And I'm sure um, my listeners would love to um, us to go even more deeper. So I'd love to have you back on. But thank you very much for being here. And thank you for sharing all of this with my listeners. And my sassy friend, until next time, make sure you stay sassy. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for joining us this week on Cash and Sass. Check us out on social media and on our website at www.thesassywealthcoach.com where you can download my free Money Story Start Guide. The website again is www.thesassywealthcoach.com. And as always, subscribe to the show to catch every new episode and leave us a review so we can continue to bring you fresh content. And remember, yes, it is possible to have sassy and sexy money. See you next week.